Welcome to the Theology on Homosexuality podcast and the Torch Leadership Foundation Institute's inaugural edition of the Heal Lutzer McKissick Lecture Series, Part 3. This lecture series is in honor of E.V. Heal, Erwin Lutzer, and Dwight McKissick for standing for God, truth, and righteousness down through the years without compromise. My name is Daniel White III, President of Gospel Light Society International. This podcast was created primarily to inform the Christian church about why it must stand against homosexuality, homosexual marriage, homosexual parenting, and the homosexual agenda. The biblical portrait of marriage, family, and sexuality has uh, unfortunately come under attack in our society, and it is time for the church to stand up and to educate our culture about the dangers of same-sex marriage and the same-sex agenda, while at the same time to promote God's idea of marriage between one man and one woman, God's view of the family structure, and God's view of sexuality as being permissible, and pleasurable within the safety and sanctity of marriage. The normalization of homosexuality and everything that pertains to it is probably the greatest danger facing our world today. Yes, greater even than ISIS. Thus, it is imperative that the body of Christ choose to stop ignoring this prevailing issue and stand up for what God says on this matter before it completely destroys our country. This podcast is designed to equip pastors, church leaders, and Christians everywhere to take a firm stand for God against homosexuality and the homosexual agenda in the spirit of love, grace, and truth so that we will not be responsible for allowing this nation to implode on our watch. Our Theology on Homosexuality passage from the Word of God today is Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. The Bible reads, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, beloved, allow me to share with you some important points regarding this passage from David Guzik's commentary on the Bible. He goes on to say, Paul uses homosexuality, both female and male, as an example of God giving them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Some say that the Bible nowhere condemns lesbian homosexuality. 
But the likewise of Romans one twenty seven makes it clear that the sin of homosexuality condemned in Romans one twenty seven is connected to the sin of women mentioned in Romans one twenty six. Paul doesn't even use the normal words for men and women here. He uses the words for male and female using categories that describe sexuality outside of human terms because the type of sexual sin he describes is outside of human dignity. Paul categorizes the whole section under the idea of vile passions, unhealthy passions, unholy passions. Nevertheless, Paul lived in a culture that openly approved of homosexuality. Paul didn't write this to a culture that agreed with him, but one that disagreed with him fiercely. Paul wrote to a culture where homosexuality was accepted as a part of life for both men and women. For some 200 years, men who openly practiced homosexuality often with young boys ruled the Roman Empire. At times, the Roman Empire specifically taxed approved homosexual prostitution and gave boy prostitutes a legal holiday. Legal marriage between same-gender couples was recognized even back then, and even some of the emperors married other men. At the very time Paul was writing, Nero was emperor. He took a boy named Sporus and had him castrated, then married him with a full ceremony, brought him to the palace with a great procession, and made the boy his wife. Later Nero lived with another man, and Nero was the wife. Homosexual practice truly is an abomination in our present culture as well. Statistics tell us that on average 43% of homosexuals say that they have had 500 or more sexual partners in their lifetime, and only 1% of homosexuals say they have had four or less sexual partners in their lifetime. According to the United States Department of Health and Human Services, 77% of homosexuals say they have met sexual partners in a city park, 62% in a homosexual bar, 61% in a theater, 31% in a public restroom, only 28% of homosexuals said that they had known their partners for at least a week before participating in homosexual sex. Homosexuals often seem to specialize in anonymous sex with no emotional commitment. At one time, London AIDS clinics defined a woman as promiscuous, if she had more than six partners in her lifetime. They gave up trying to apply a workable definition to male homosexuals when it became clear that they saw almost no homosexual men who had less than six sexual partners a year. Beloved, our theology on homosexuality quotes today are from uh, Pastor Dwight McKissick and uh, Dr. John MacArthur. Uh, Pastor Dwight McKissick said President Obama has betrayed the Bible and the black church with his endorsement of same-sex marriage. The Bible is crystal clear on this subject. And the black church strongly opposes same-sex marriage. 
His endorsement is an inadvertent attack on the Christian faith. America is now a candidate for the same judgment received by Sodom and Gomorrah. This was a sad, sad day and a very bad decision by our beloved president. The moral impact of this day and decision is equal to the military impact of Al-Qaeda when they attacked the Twin Towers on 9-11. This announcement is a moral earthquake equivalent to a tsunami or hurricane that will have far more devastating results than Katrina. John MacArthur said, Why does God condemn homosexuality? Because it overturns God's fundamental design for human relationships, a design that pictures the complementary relationship between a man and a woman, why then have homosexual interpretations of Scripture been so successful at persuading so many people? Simple. People want to be convinced. Since the Bible is so clear about the issue, sinners have had to defy reason and embrace error to quiet their accusing consciences. As Jesus said, men loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. As a Christian, you must not compromise what the Bible says about homosexuality ever, no matter how much you desire to be compassionate to the homosexual. Your first sympathies belong to the Lord and to the exaltation of his righteousness. Homosexuals stand in defiant rebellion against the will of their Creator, who from the beginning made them male and female. Our theology on homosexuality topic is titled, The Church Must Speak, Part 3, From the Truth About Same-Sex Marriage, Six Things You Need to Know About What's Really at Stake by Dr. Erwin Lutzer. And I want to remind you to take advantage of our special offer. If you enjoy this podcast or you get something from this podcast, please feel free to purchase a copy of this book, The Truth About Same-Sex Marriage, Six Things You Need to Know uh, About What's Really at Stake. It is available on our website, torchleadershipfoundation.com, for just $20. Dr. Urban Lutzer goes on to ask the question, what is a family? If anyone is inclined to think that civil unions are a better alternative than same-sex marriage, let's look at what is happening in France. Their civil solidarity pacts have been created for homosexuals so that they can file joint income tax returns and receive welfare and unemployment benefits. France took this a step further than same-sex partnerships and made these pacts available to everyone, including cohabitating heterosexual couples, to widowed sisters, even to priests and their housekeepers. Because these packs are easier to enter and easier to exit and impose fewer legal obligations, many heterosexual couples enter into these agreements rather than getting married. If these couples think that these packs provide a stable home environment for children, they should keep in mind that the rate of separation among cohabitating couples is five times that of married couples. 
and the reconciliation rate of cohabitors is only 33% of the rate among married couples. David Frum writes, Apologists for cohabitation praise it as a less burdensome alternative to marriage. The truth is that it is a near certain prelude to fatherlessness. He continues, The argument over gay marriage is only incidentally and secondarily an argument over gays. What it is first and fundamentally is an argument over marriage. Gay marriage will turn out in practice to mean the creation of an alternative form of legal coupling that will be available to homosexual and heterosexuals alike. Gay marriage, as the French are vividly demonstrating, does not extend marital rights. It abolishes marriage and puts a new flimsier institution in its place. Consider, if marriage is no longer the union of one man and one woman, but rather any two persons who want to cohabit, who is to say that it must be limited to two people? Why not a trio of three men or women? And why not one man with two wives or ten wives? After all, we must extend equal rights to all individuals to live according to any arrangement they wish, right? The end result is the destruction of marriage as we know it, with children the losers. It is simply not possible to have two views of marriage coexist in any one country or society. A conference on national European and international law explored the question of whether marriage should exist at all. They discussed the strategies on how to bypass each nation's democratic process and use the judicial process to sanction same-sex marriages. They also discussed how adults could be free to pursue any sexual relationship they want with no legal restrictions whatsoever. Uh, Jean Edward Veith, writing in World Magazine, summed up the consequences for our society if marriage is redefined. Under the emerging framework, there will be no difference between a married couple, a homosexual couple, or a couple in a temporary sexual relationship. As many advocates are putting it, what difference does it make to the government or an employer whom you are having sex with? This sort of reductionism, a spouse is nothing more than a sex partner, so a sex partner is the same as a spouse, misses the point of what marriage is and what its role in society amounts to. As marriage becomes unnecessary, not just for job benefits, but for adopting children, inheriting property, and being socially acceptable, the whole nation will be living in sin. Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, We thank you for allowing us to go through uh, this period of the uh, lecture. Thank you for what we have learned. Thank you for what we have heard. Forgive us and cleanse us of our sins. Crucify our flesh and the old man within us. And fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to do your will. Your way. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, dear friend, if you're listening today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as your personal Savior, allow me to show you how. First, dear friend, accept the fact that you are a sinner. 
and that you have broken God's law. And so have I. We all have. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. The Bible states in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Third, accept the fact that you are on the road to hell. That's right. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10.28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Also, the Bible states in Revelation 21.8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, I know this is bad news, but I'm here to tell you, if you live in sin and you never trust Christ as Savior, you're going to spend eternity in hell. I know that that is not popular, but it is true. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ has said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, that is, perish in hell, but have everlasting life. Just believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead by the power of God for you so that you can live forever with him. Pray and ask him to come into your heart today to save your soul, and he will save you. Romans ten nine through 13 says that if thou, you, shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the black and the white, the red and the yellow, the young and the old, the rich and the poor. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Until next time, my beloved, may God bless you and keep you.